Very good morning, good afternoon to you all. Welcome to the fourth Institute of Risk Management webinar. Um, I'm very delighted to announce um, that, um, that the number of viewings um, keep them going up um, as well, and so you can have the opportunity of downloading this presentation afterwards or, or um, mail it to your colleagues or, or to your friends um, after this webinar as well. I'm delighted to introduce to you Dr. Ariane Chappelle, who is an honorary fellow at UCL, University College London, here in England. Um, she's an IRM-approved trainer um, with us at the Institute of Risk Management, and also um, she's a columnist for Op Risk and Regulation. And um, on this topic, which has really come to prominence in the last you know, six, eight, 12 months, um, um, I hope to clean some tips and some techniques and also some confidence around how to um, certainly build and deliver um, effective KRIs. So please welcome um, Ariane, um, over to you. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, good morning to you all. So this talk will be uh, focusing, as you know, on key risk indicators. What I would like to um, go through with you today is a suggestion of a typology, a classification of key risk indicators to uh, clarify this topic that may be challenging for some of the institutions. Uh, after the classification, we're going to review the, the feature. We're going to write a Christmas list uh, for good features of key risk indicators and discuss what good looks like. Um, and finally, um, we'll finish this uh, webinar by uh, some tools and techniques to validate key risk indicators. How do you know it works is an important question in risk management. I'll be happy to take your questions. Uh, either during the webinar or at the end, depending on the topic and how many there are. But we're going to start with a quick poll question, very easy. Do your, does your institution currently use key risk indicators, yes or no? Please enter. I'll give you a few seconds, or, um, dozens of seconds to answer, and then we'll analyze your answer. Please continue voting. All right, so we have two-thirds of uh, the respondents saying that they use key risk indicators. Now, um, for those who are deciding to start, uh, good news or bad news is uh, it's not the first step of your risk management framework. Uh, on this graph, you see a very simplified view of the process when establishing a risk management framework, starting with the board responsibility uh, of the governance, the definition of the strategy that will then um, generate the, the different risks and the necessary first step of the identification of risks. So once the strategy is established by the board, we have the different risk and the different intensity of these risks that the strategy entails, and that will drive the discussions of risk appetite. And this risk appetite will then be translated into the organization uh, and expressed at different levels of the organization via the heat maps or um, otherwise called the risk and control self-assessment. And then the, the monitoring of the risk taking and the respective risk appetite and the risk taking within the organization uh, will be done uh, in part by key risk indicators. So it's only after all these steps and actually in practice um, more that key risk indicators emerge. Another way of uh, saying similar things is, uh, has been published by the Financial Service Authority, so the, the FSA now, the PRA, the British regulator uh, many years ago already, um, with the different level and mode of expressions of risk appetite throughout the organization. On this pyramid, you see that at board level, the risk appetite is expressed by capital or more specifically by the overcapitalization of the organization. The more you capitalize, the overcapitalize compared to your needs or your capital requirement, the more risk averse you are. At the business line level, risk appetite is uh, rather defined into uh, risk identification and reaction to these risks and risk assessment. And from business unit uh, level onwards, um, that's where you introduce the risk management tools per se, the heat maps or the RCSA, the key risk indicators, and our main topic of the day, and our loss data. And at business support function, uh, you only pilot 
or you could only pilot and express your risk appetite in terms of lost data, uh, collection of lost events, incidents, um, lost data budget uh, sometimes for what has happened and key, key risk indicators what could happen. And that will be one of our main focus of today is to make sure that your list of key risk indicators are not a list of incident reporting, very useful, but these are not leading key risk indicators and you know it, that's probably why you're registered. So um, about key risk indicators, like I said, I would like um, to suggest to you four categories, failure, exposure, stress, and causal. And these are detailed in the two papers that you see referenced below that you can download uh, freely off the internet. One of them being published by the, uh, the Institute of Risk Management, by the way. So before we move on, um, I'd like to assess your level of satisfaction with regards to your key risk indicators, please. So can you please select one of the, uh, the first proposal, A, B, or C? You would qualify your current key risk indicators as satisfactory, but we can always do more, not great, trying to improve, painful waste of time, or oh, we have none, but we're looking to have some. All right, a few more seconds, maybe. Right, okay, so no one thinks it's a painful waste of time, so that's probably the first piece of good news. The majority of answer is answer B, not great, but trying to improve 54% uh, of the respondents, 11% are satisfied, and 31%, uh, so we're close to this one, uh, one third, um, are don't have any and look for some. I must say that a, we had a late respondent, one or two, uh, saying that it is a painful waste of time. But anyway, overall, the majority of you um, are trying to improve and, and a small minority think it's satisfactory. Very good. So going to the classification. First category, failure indicators. Um, this one um, constant topic of debate I'd like to address uh, here today is what is a KRI, a KPI, a KCI, and are they different? Well, if you really want to segregate them or, or define them differently, you can qualify the key risk indicators are um, the indicators of troubles ahead, so you want them to address risk and not event. So uh, to me, there's no such thing as lagging indicators. It's just uh, incident reports, or at least in the immense majority of the cases and you want leading indicators, that's why we're here. Key performance indicators shape behavior, at least if they're key performance indicators of people. And key control indicators is quite obviously uh, measure uh, the effectiveness of control. However, uh, we should be really aware that in many instances, uh, KPI is a KRI or KPI is also a KCI and a KRI and vice versa. So indeed, failed performance constitutes a risk, and whether it's a failed performance in IT, or for instance, a long IT response time, might raise the risk, not for, for IT itself, but for other parts of the business, like quality of information, customer satisfaction, a ride MI, et cetera. Uh, failed performance in call center raise obvious risk of customer satisfaction, customer complaints, um, pirating of the business and referrals. And then when you have a failed performance in a control function, you have um, a failed control because it's the control function. And if you have a failed control, well, almost automatically you have a risk indicator. So all failed KCIs, RKRIs, unless your controls are useless, which is not a good place to be anyway. So in the particular example I mentioned here, like pending confirmation in back offices, in, for instance, financial market and trading activities, you have at the same time a KPI, a KCI, and a KRI. Uh, I know we, all, we not only have financial institutions on the audience today, all the sectors are represented. So let me elaborate on this a little bit more. So regardless of the activity, whether it's in the financial market or other areas such as procurement or business development, you can pretty much um, 
segregate your activities into what I would call a selection phase and a monitoring phase. The selection phase is the initiation, uh, the, um, the first step of uh, a business or an activity. In credit activity, it would be the selection of a client before you the credit allocation. So it uh, relates to client identification, improvement, credit allocation. And then once the credit is allowed, you have the monitoring phase, which is basically monitoring if the people are repaying their, their loans, so that's the cash flow of reimbursement. In market activities, you have the selection phase being selecting a portfolio and then the monitoring, making sure that this portfolio is producing the financial results it's expected. At procurement level, you select a vendor, um, you, select, you, you check your request, um, you select same thing in IT at the selection phase, you write the specifications. During the monitoring phase, it's more about quality timing uh, and, uh, and quality monitoring and assurance of uh, product and service delivery. At business level, at business development level, you select, for instance, your joint venture. So uh, putting all this together, you can see that in, in the selection phase, it, the selection phase is pretty much made of one control after another, and some of these controls are key. If I take uh, credit allocation, for instance, or KYC regulation, uh, you have compliance to uh, key controls and uh, key elements of uh, the way of doing business and anti-money laundering um, regulation, for instance, uh, but you have all the critical controls such as the due, due diligence on uh, partners and suppliers. So in that space, uh, most key risk indicators are failed control indicators. In the monitoring space, uh, we are in the life of a contract, and most of the steps are uh, well, piloting and observing the quality of what is delivered and, the, and the, um, the timeliness of what is delivered. So most of your monitoring tools are key performance indicators. And in that case, if this performance fail, an SLA that is not uh, respected by a vendor, um, a response time on the phone uh, for call centers, the, the reimbursement of uh, credit uh, loans, the, the payment of insurance premium, etc., that raises the risk of either a deterioration of the credit worthiness of a client, non-payment by an uh, uh, insurance taker, etc., etc. So the good news here is you must have, and I'm sure you do, uh, a lot of people viewing us are, have a number of control indicators and have definitely an army of key performance indicators. So my, my first suggestion to you is look at what you have and recycle what you have or uh, rename what you have, being, bearing in mind that a lot of your KPIs, when they start um, cracking a threshold, are also key risk indicators. There's no need to um, go with uh, something, uh, something else. Let's move on to the next category now. Key risk indicators are risk drivers. In a nutshell, a key risk indicator is a driver, uh, is a metric of a risk driver. So the other categories I want to address with you are uh, uh, specifically around these risk drivers and from, uh, from top down. Most of uh, the risk driver are specific to an activity, so typically you're going to use key risk indicators that are uh, bottom-up. However, if you like top-down indicators, there are some uh, that you can address to your own business by measuring the change in your risk environment regarding exposure and vulnerabilities. What are they? Well, your exposure are your main distribution channels, your main clients, suppliers, third parties, everything that is listed here on uh, these tables. These are the things you want to watch. You don't want your distribution channels to dry out, your main clients to uh, either be over-concentrated or leave or be at risk of leaving. So um, same thing with your critical systems, the regulation you submitted to, etc., etc. So these are, um, let's say, one of top-down indicators that will flag every time you have a change in your risk environment. Uh, in your business environment that will change your exposure to risk. And your vulnerabilities are all your Achilles heels. 
okay, where uh, the weakest links, the fragile systems, the people resistant to uh, risk management uh, techniques and tools, the unmonitored operation, overdue uh, BCP uh, for testing or training of staff on, uh, on business continuity, for instance. In risk management, as you know, uh, there's very much the, the weakest link theory very much applies. You're just the strongest, your weakest link. So you want to um, a check for these weakest links. So that's for our exposure indicators. Before we move on to the third category, um, I have another question for you. Uh, what are the main areas for which you capture uh, key risk indicators? Feel free to enter um, several items here. Several answers are possible. External fraud, improper business practice, business disruption, financial risks, or processing error. We are waiting for your answers. So, so far, I don't have any, I have one answer on uh, improper business practice. And the rest is pretty much uniformly dis distributed between external fraud, business disruption, financial risk, and processing error. So we have 20% roughly, I, if I round the number, 20% external fraud, 3% improper business practice, 20% business disruption, 30% financial risk, and 30% processing error. Okay, so 30% financial risk and processing error, 20 for the others, and just 3% for improper business practice. And this doesn't surprise me because financial risk is probably one of the areas for which we have the most data and the most knowledge of the risk drivers, such as credit risk, uh, for instance, or market risk. And knowing the risk drivers, of course, helps defining care high, so that makes sense. Processing error is, of course, the bread and butter um, in terms of drivers of operation risk, so uh, it's not surprising that you have an increased attention for that one. Um, external fraud is a bit surprising. Um, my suspicion is there is, you have a lot of indicators for external fraud. They may not be called care high. The surprise, uh, surprising aspect for me is improper business practice uh, because at least for the financial sector, it's a main driver of uh, immense regulatory fine, as many of you know, and maybe some of you have experience, I have no idea. Um, so, so that'd be good to look at. So taking risks that are may, maybe not obvious to find clear high for, such as improper business practice, uh, the advice here would be to look at the cause quite naturally, the causes of the risk, and more specifically, the cause, the cause of the cause, the cause of the cause of the cause, etc. What do I mean? Well, whether you call them risk drivers, causal factors, risk factors, they're all synonymous uh, to what causes an incident or what to increase the risk of adverse consequences. So you know the, the, the chain, um, the, the approach of uh, origin or cause event impact. If you expand this into the different causes and the different consequences at uh, every level, you have a tool, a um, root cause analysis tool that is uh, very well known at the Institute of Risk Management and by many members amongst you. Um, who are uh, at the Institute of Risk Management and in the bow tie, which is one of the core of the, the fundamentals of risk management course. Um, how, do you, how do you read the bow tie? Well, you can look at it the same way as a fishbone or a five wise analysis. You start from the event, an event you want to analyze and understand a bit, a bit better. And on the left hand side, you're going to detail the direct causes of the incident, so why it has happened. But then why does the direct cause have happened? So asking why again, and why, 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 hence the five why analysis, very similar, until you, you don't have to find any, any further causes. On the right-hand side of the graph, you have the consequences. What are the direct consequences of the events and the, the uh, indirect consequences of the events? 
Between all these causes and consequences, you see the black bars that each represent a control, or in that case, a field control for that the incident that happened. On the left-hand side, we're talking about preventative control, of course, and on the right-hand side, about uh, mitigating actions or recovery measures uh, as stipulated on the graph. So, for example, if you have an event being we send the, the contract, the credit card contract, uh, of, to clients with a, with a field missing, such as the interest rate missing. Why? Oh, because so-and-so made a mistake. And what else? Oh, because the update in the system didn't work. So you have two direct calls. Jim made a mistake, or whoever. Of course, it's an inventive name. And uh, system error. Why did Jim made a mistake? Because no one told him he had to update the file. Why did no one told him that, that he updated the file? Um, because we don't have a project management uh, system. Why did we have a project management? Because we thought it wasn't important, it wasn't the side of management, etc., etc. Why did we have a, a system failure? Because the system hasn't been uh, upgraded the proper way. Why hasn't it been upgraded the proper way, etc., etc.? You can um, invent any, uh, any example you want, or more specifically, you can apply that to, uh, to your business. Um, I've run both eye analysis with many, many uh, uh, companies and participants in different trainings or, um, or consulting projects. It is an extremely powerful tool to go down to the root of what drives an incident. So uh, regardless of the key risk indicators, it is a useful tool. However, it is also a powerful tool um, to capture different uh, or define different leading care highs because that's where you have an image of your risk drivers. So two examples for you. Uh, human resources, in the, in the field of human resource, uh, and more specifically, people risk. Uh, people risk key staff, key men risk. I'll start uh, with the right hand side. If you want to start with the impact, what do you want to avoid? Which is also a useful question when you address risk management because at the end of the day, risk management is a um, negative in impact that you want to avoid. So what do you want to avoid? From the, the knowledge loss in your organization, that might lead to business disruptions and financial impact. Okay, what are the risks of that? What are the events that would drive this impact? Well, the abrupt loss or resignation of key staff. So what are the drivers for that? And here it's useful to split the risk drivers into two types of drivers, the drivers of impact and the drivers of likelihood. So in terms of drivers of impact, which is linked to the notion of exposure as well, is the concentration of information on key people. Do you have key people in your organization and how much uh, unique information these people have? The drivers of likelihood are the drivers of resignation. Okay, what makes people more likely to resign? And, and here, to take a simple approach, it's basically bad boss or bad pay. You, you don't like the people you, you work with, or you're unhappy with your pay, or both. In that case, you will resign, probably. Um, so what you want is you want to, to have metrics around these risk drivers, care high for bad pay, simply pay gap compared to market rate. Any HR function should have these data available, or at least know where to look for it. Um, and I know an for a fact an organization who has prevented a massive resignation in a particular area where the market was sent by filling in the pay gap of the people, only the people they wanted to retain. Bad boss, same thing, HR responsibility that have the result of a 360 review, some satisfaction survey or some engagement survey. And these care highs are a lot more leading, effective, and specific that a overwhelmingly common care high called star turnover. Star turnover, the people have already slammed the door. I mean, what are you trying to prevent? More people leaving potentially, but better to prevent it before they leave and after they close the door. Uh, in terms of, these are for the drivers of the likelihood. Uh, for the driver of impact, you can measure uh, the, the number of your, your exposure to information concentration, for instance, with the number of key staff. Uh, full stop in the organization and then a key staff without a train alternate and without documented processes. Uh, and I know a number of large organizations that do that centrally for their HR function. Second example, processing at home. Many of you 
have KRI for processing errors, so I will be uh, happy at the end of this section or at the end of the webinar to take questions or comments of uh, what are the types of key risk indicators you use for that. Here, uh, in terms of drivers of errors, I'll take two, um, fatigue and lack of attention. So people make mistakes because they're tired, or people make mistakes because they don't pay attention in that case. It's not technically a mistake, it's more called a slip. And for those of you who are watching and coming from the non-financial industry and know about the work of James Reason and others, you know the difference between a slip, which is an unintentional error, and a mistake, which is an intentional error. And for those of you who are in the financial sector, I do advise you to dig down a bit more deeper into the drivers of human error. I'm sure you'll learn lots of things, like I do. Um, so, going back to the cause of the cause, so the direct cause would be fatigue and lack of attention. Why are people tired? Well, because there's a resource shortages um, and because they're poor processes. What you can also look at is why is there a lack of attention? Uh, maybe because there's a lack of accountability. It's not written in the slide, but you start knowing the process here. Why is there a lack of accountability? Um, because there's no um, risk-based performance measurement, for instance. So going back to the resource shortages and uh, the capture of these drivers for fatigue uh, and demotivation, lack of resources, um, some classic KRIs that, again, are used in a number of organizations and maybe in yours, long-term vacancies, for instance, over three months. Uh, lack of resource planning, so that's uh, at the limit between a causal care high and a um, failed control because the resource planning is an effective control for, for, uh, to fight for um, overcapacity. Number of projects and tasks overrun. Uh, expression of fatigue and demotivation, which can also capture the lack of attention number of days of sick leave, overtime, number of uh, unpaid leave. So, so the sick leave and the unpaid leave um, express typically the, the lack of motivation when the number of overtime, of course, um, express the intensity of work. Uh, poor processes, um, you can count the number of duplicated tasks, number of manual processes, or a uh, number of uh, handover points. This is not, of course, for the poor processes KRIs, not a monitoring that you would you know, do on a frequent basis. These are more just one off to uh, express the level of, of risk and stretch you have in your organization. So um, putting that in a more uh, theoretical step, you can uh, look at these graphs. It's easier to look at it bottom up from the impact. So what are the impacts you want to try to avoid? What are the risks that uh, these uh, that are generated by this impact, and then what are the different risk drivers, the cause level one, the cause level two, cause level three, etc. And then you're going to, the idea is to find for each of these goals at each level possibly, or some of them, chances are that you won't be able to find reliable and easy metrics for all your key risk indicators, and I'll come to the future in a minute, um, but you will derive, define your, your key risk indicators around, around these different causes. So that leads us to uh, the whole classification of, uh, of key risk indicators and allows me to introduce uh, the fourth one that I have in detail with you yet. So we have the exposure indicators. So this is published by the, the, um, the risk management, the Institute of Risk Management, so you'll see it uh, if you want. So the exposure indicators flag any significant change in the nature of your business environment or if you're uh, in, in your, your exposure and vulnerability. Stress indicators uh, express how much an, an organization is under uh, stress or is stretched in their resources. So if you have, again, a significant change in the use of resources, whether it's human resources, machine resources, on the slides before we talked about number of hours of overtime and, um, and lack of resource planning and um, long-term vacancies, but you also have uh, all the flags of system overload. Um, I can give you here the the real example, the public example of SWIFT, the messaging transmission company that uses, that call everybody, all the indicators that are called KPIs, they completely eliminated the debate key risk indicators, key performance, key control indicators, 
And uh, some of the so-called key performance indicators are linked to network overload, system overload, like, like many IT institutions. Um, so again, um, as linked to the failure indicators, there's a lot of indicators you have in organizations that may not, in your organization that may not be called KRIs, but are just their performance and control. Um, so that's the fourth category. And the third category that you hear, uh, you see here in the slides are the causal uh, indicators. So that's basically all the others, all the, the metrics of the risk drivers like I just did here. All right. So, uh, finally, another uh, way of looking at it or, or, or structure it, you look at the impact, you identify the drivers of impact uh, of uh, so consequences and the drivers of likelihood uh, for a risk, what are your aggravating factors, and what are your metrics of uh, loss factor, or, you know, risk drivers of impact basically, and risk drivers of likelihood. And then for the different types of course, you can find key risk indicators. Uh, I'll just check um, if there's any questions. No, feel free to come up with questions if you want. If not, we'll wait until the end. So that basically um, ends of the first part of these presentations, which are the different types of key risk indicators. Now, just briefly, our Christmas list, um, or Santa letter for, for key risk indicators, what are the best uh, features you can think of when you design key risk indicators? Well, you want them to be early warning, okay? They signal a change in risk, and that relates very much to what we discussed so far. So you want to flag an increase in the probability or in the impact of the risk before it materializes. So it, when a care high flag flags red, it doesn't mean that you will have a loss. It means that you have to watch for it, prepare for it, or mitigate it. So that's why you want key risk indicators to address risk, not events, and to capture risk drivers. Uh, lagging indicators are actually uh, incident reports with another name. They're absolutely useful, but they serve a different purpose. And because you need to capture risk drivers, your key risk indicators need to be specific to each activity, specific to your own weaknesses, to your own vulnerabilities and exposure, if I relate to our first categories of KRIs, and also, uh, this is driven by the culture you have in your own institution, and that means that one size does not fit all. Fit all. Um, you probably will end up with a more relevant economical list of key risk indicators if you develop that in-house than if you look at uh, someone else's list or, or any uh, comprehensive uh, other list that may, may exist out there. And how do, I, do you identify these KRIs? By data analysis, of course, uh, but first and foremost by business experience. <coughs> business experience are useful to complement the lack of data. Um, and as a general rule in, in data analysis and statistics, what you want is when you, you want your, da your data to test the theory. So you have the, the theory or the idea that if your, your people are in a noisy environment, they will make more errors where well, you can try uh, different types of uh, settings, workplace settings, and see if it impacts uh, the level of error. So you, you, you test the theory, you test the principles. Um, data are used to confirm your business interest. Now, key risk indicators are just one form of reporting. So the rule of effective uh, reporting apply uh, to key risk indicators. And in particular, they, uh, they might request um, uh, heavy data collection. They might be very expensive. So you really have to be, bear in mind a trade-off between having a KRI um, and the cost of a collection. So as a general rule for reporting, you want to make sure that the value of information you collect exceeds the cost of collection. Also, KRI needs to be timely, uh, so in, in a lot of the cases, better if they're automated. Uh, let alone that it might uh, help the access control and data uh, integrity. So you want your timely care highs and easy to use and timely, which is also a feature um, that is desirable for any reporting. Uh, you want your care highs to, to be monitored at the same rhythm as the level of the activity. 
And to explain here, you have the continuous environment with IT or, or high online banking or online activity, online sale, online vending. Uh, where you have continuous exposure, continuous risk, and you need continuous flag, these are, of course, automated, versus the one-off, such as the changes business environment, like the exposure clear height or, or clear height related to HR that are quarterly or, or semi-annual. Again, la another rule for reporting, reporting must help business uh, decisions. So if your key risk indicators do not drive business decision, even if the decision is the status quo, is not to change anything, uh, they're probably not very useful. And finally, in terms of design, you want the threshold of your key risk indicators being linked to risk appetite. So typically, you're going to have a lower risk appetite for the core business, or more specifically to the core value of your business, is the main value of your business are intangible. Uh, like knowledge or brand value or reputation, you want to protect that first and foremost. If your core value is uh, engineering or quality of a product, these are your lowest risk appetite, so that's where you're going to have the more strict thresholds for uh, all your, the indicators of your risk. Now, bear in mind that even though you might have a 100 or a 99.999 reliability target for um, for your your controls, you don't need a 100% threshold or even a 999 or even a 99% uh, thresholds for all your controls. If you have independent controls and you've done basic probabilities, you know that with three independent controls in a row at 90% reliable, the chain of these three controls failing in a row is 10% times 10% times 10%, that's 0.1%. So with three controls at 90%, you have 99% reliability. I don't know how many of you followed me on this, but um, I can send you a note if you're interested. Uh, and finally, that will be our topic of our third subsection of today. Uh, you want to be sure it works. So you want to backset your uh, key risk indicators for uh, reliability, for validity and predictability. Okay. So that leads us to our third topic. How do you validate your key risk indicators? So um, I'd like to, um, to see if you, um, if you are in that space. So can you please answer this question? Would you say that uh, your care high have ever helped you prevent incidents? Yes, regularly. Yes, rarely. Or not yet. Okay, we're waiting for a few more seconds. Please keep answering. Okay, so we have, if I round the numbers a little bit, we have 60% not yet, 38% uh, uh, yes, rarely, and only 6% uh, regularly. I rounded the numbers. So you it's actually higher than one. So the real percentage are 639 and 55. So more than half of you um, do not consider that your key risk indicators have helped you prevent incidents. Now, maybe some of you don't have care as yet, which may be the answer. But you, we are not in a space where key risk indicators re regularly prevent incidents. So I'm with you. There's, uh, there's probably uh, some improvement to be done in terms of flagging the risk to come. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying there's a space here. So imagine that you've done all this. You have your risk drivers. You've met, you have your metrics. You collect your, your, your key risk indicators. You have the governance around it, aspects that we haven't covered today, uh, but we could at a later stage or some other time. How do you know it works? How do you validate so very simply, if you don't have data really to um, test that statistically, you can do what um, a number of Dutch, German, and Australian banks have met uh, do, is that to check in your, in your, in your incident report, and, and maybe some of you do that as well, in your incident report, the color of your care height. So when you have an event, check the color of the related key risk indicators. And chances are that you 
will have a number of key risk indicators that relate to an incident, like an incident has several risk drivers, so therefore should have several key risk indicators. A question I have often is how many indicators do you need? I would say the minimum meaningful number. So you need at least one key risk indicator for significant per significant cause, but don't capture four times the same thing. You're going to have re redundant data, noisy data, and potentially more importantly, uh, an increased cost of collection and information overload that will actually destroy the value of your, key risk in, uh, your reporting. So once you have your, your related KRI, if they were green when you had an incident, there's a problem with your KRI. They're probably not capturing what they need to capture, or they're probably too lagging or, or capturing incidents rather than risk. If they were amber or red, good news is they were flagging a risk that eventually materialized, but you probably have a governance issue. How come that no one acted or no one acted effectively? So it's not the KRI that you need to check, it's a governance around it. So conversely, when you have indicators turning red or amber, you, you need to check, has it led to events? Um, if yes, well, well, we're back to the, the point one, how come that no one prevented it? Uh, if not, well, either you've been lucky, so that's good, uh, or your action was taken to avoid incidents, so that's, um, and that's excellent, that's exactly what you want, or maybe your care highs are inappropriate, either because they're too strict, your threshold is, is uh, too restricted, uh, compared to what the real risk situation is, um, uh, or they're, they're flagging a wrong risk. So that's the, the no data simple post validation case. If you have data, uh, well, you're in a much better place. Um, and you can use them to backtest your, your key risk indicators, but you also you can use them to uh, effectively select thresholds, of course, uh, in line with, with your risk appetite. So you have different, um, a different type of relationship. We can ha you can have a, a, a simple linear relationship um, that would be, um, I don't know, let's take the availability, the, the system availability um, compared to the, um, the age of the system uh, because our data system break more. Uh, you can have some linear relationship typically with the, the volume, the volatility of the market and, well, it's not exactly linear, but it, it increases um, the volatility of the financial market and the n number of transactions in back offices. So when you see a, a change in, the, in the, the financial market volatility, you know you will have more transactions in back office. So you know you have uh, more errors. And that leads me to the second graph, which are the, the specific thresholds and inflection points. So that you can relate to the human reliability theory that links the, the productivity with the number of things to do and um, uh, derives from that the number of errors with uh, the number of things to do. So depending, going back to our transaction, number of transactions and processing errors, you, you have an optimal here. Too little transaction is not good because people are bored or it means that they're not working as efficiently as they can or because the business is too slow. And too many transactions is not good because people are stressed or make more errors and if they, they hit the capacity limit, and that's where your, your error rate rises more than proportionally. And in, in, uh, in between, uh, people are more productive and they tend to make less errors. So you have to know uh, ideally with data, if you don't have data, relate to published theory of how your, uh, your effects work and your risk evolves. Another uh, simple uh, example of, uh, of data-driven thresholds based on a call center, uh, some things that you would have care highs in call centers. So if you relate the customer satisfaction with the phone waiting time, this is a fictitious ideal example, but just to show you how it works. Um, you could say that up to 10 seconds on waiting on the phone, customer are satisfied to, between two seconds and eight seconds. It really doesn't change the satisfaction, so you, you're, still, you're still happy. And then after 
uh, after 10 seconds, you have a drop in your satisfaction and you're more and more unhappy uh, as more as the time goes by. And after, let's say, two minutes, depending on an individual patient, of course, after two minutes, you, you're, um, you're unhappy and you hang up the phone. So it really doesn't change if the phone waiting time is two minutes or 12 minutes. Um, this graph just shows that before you put arbitrary thresholds and, and KPIs and SLAs, on your call center, your vendors, your whatever, it's useful to have some indication of, the, of your data or where your clusters are and what is the customer satisfaction in that example that you want to reach. And of course, on this graph, you have your natural cluster and your natural threshold for your KRIs of what constitute uh, green and blue and red. Now, there's another. Um, Interesting article, not new by any stretch, published in uh, 2004 by the RMA Journal and is uh, quite undeservedly uh, unnoticed by, um, by many uh, in, the, in the key risk indicators community. It's called, uh, quite simply, Predictive Care High. And I really encourage you, you can find it on the internet, uh, I encourage you to read it. Uh, what the authors have done is that they've applied the Six Sigma uh, analysis to the selection and design of key risk indicators. Uh, so I, I won't go along on, on the article, but this is just for the part of the threshold, uh, the, the threshold de defi definition. Data driven again, you have here, it's also a call center uh, case study, customer satisfaction versus the communication score of the people over the phone. And uh, you see these uh, sadly very uh, sparse cloud of points that the company have defined what the customer satisfaction level they want. So basically, uh, nothing before seven, below 70% and ideally above 75%. So that constitutes a target communication score of 2.6 for people on the phone and no lower than 2.2. Uh, .2. So. In your business, uh, you can uh, very much replicate this uh, when you have data. But, however, one, uh, one word of caution regarding data testing, trust your business experience first. And that relates to what I said earlier on with the features of uh, key risk indicators. You, you need to trust and to know your experience in the business to uh, drive your test of key risk indicators. I'll just take... Um, uh, a simple example, in, um, in, uh, in financial market activities, when you have rogue trading, you always have fictitious transactions. Um, and fictitious transactions cannot be confirmed with the client. But a lot of transactions are unconfirmed. Out of 100 transactions that are not confirmed or late confirmed in back offices for whatever reason, maybe one or maybe one in 1,000, uh, will be fictitious and will be uh, linked to rogue trading. So you cannot uh, check the causality between unconfirmed transactions to rogue trading. You won't find anything. But you know, without data testing, that every rogue trading includes false transactions. Therefore, an unconfirmed transaction is an absolute clear high in, uh, um, in the prevention of rogue trading. Um, so, in terms of, for those of you who are interested in statistics, uh, if you want to look at the uh, indicators for human errors and the drivers to test, um, time on the job to test the skill. So, you, will the skill impact the, the incidence of human error? The theory is yes, and you can capture the skills by the time in the job, the performance rating. Um, and it's useful, it would be useful to know if in your organization, if people that are high performing and are in the job for a long time have significantly less processing errors than people are new. And if the answer is yes in your organization, maybe there are some management actions to be taken uh, in terms of induction program, for instance, or in terms of training. If you think that tiredness uh, is a driver of human error, again, the theory says yes. Is it true for your organization and how much, you know, how much overtime matters? Is 10 hours a week that is, uh, that is a problem? Is it five hours a week that is a problem? Is it not at all? 
uh, is the number of transactions and after which threshold do you see an impact. These, are, these all can be tested uh, in a linear, large way, these different types of thresholds um, uh, and upper dependencies. You, you, just, uh, you, just need, uh, you just need your data. So as a conclusion, uh, I would say for preventive care highs, trust your uh, knowledge in the business. Do not create reporting blindly or do not rush into um, whatever you, you think is good. Look at what you have first. There's a lot of uh, indicators that you have in your business that may not be called uh, key risk indicators uh, that, 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 can, that should be called so and could be uh, reused and, uh, and treat your data accordingly. Be as precise as you can. Don't go for round thresholds because they're round numbers. Look at your data or collect data. Um, if you can. All right. Thank you very much for this. Uh, we still have 10 minutes together, so I'm going to uh, read out loud some of the questions we have received uh, in this presentation and, uh, and answer them. So how best can we use KRIs to measure the effectiveness of our control and mitigation? Um, well, in that case, a KRI is a KCI, so basically how do you measure, the question is, uh, the question should be, uh, how do you measure uh, the effectiveness of a control? I'd say control testing. And control testing is usually the responsibility of audit, but uh, it can absolutely be uh, carried out by the second line, so by the risk management, or uh, even more specifically by the business. So if you want to test uh, the effectiveness of your control, test your control, uh, typically by sampling. Um, do you, you know, if you have four eyes principles, uh, does your four eyes principle work? Well, make the, the, the work, the, the, the QA done, make it checked by someone completely unrelated. Uh, if you have your uh, AML checks that are automated or uh, high transactions that need uh, specific authorization, put bogus transactions in the system and see what comes up. Um, so these are, these are all sorts of examples. And if your, your, your control fails, especially your key control, you start by testing your key controls. If your key control fails, it's, it's bad news for risk. It, it, it is a care high, of course. Um, other question, do all KPIs make good care highs? Is it as straightforward than that? No, it is not. Uh, not all KPIs are good care highs. Um, it depends which one. Um, and it depends, uh, it depends on the performance of, of, uh, of the critical drivers, value drivers of your organization. I'm thinking call centers, for instance. I have a thing about call centers, uh, and, and probably for, for all of you. Everything that you see, the only thing you you see from your utilities company, phone company, television company, your internet company is a call center. So, so it's, it's the, not the face, it's the voice uh, of the organization. And if you have a failed performance in, in, your, in your call center, it does flag a risk of bad referrals and shrinking, shrinking market shares. That's one example, because call centers are important value drivers, the performance of them are, are, are risk, the, the failed performance of them are important risk drivers. But you can see that the performance of your core systems, let's say the performance of your, the KPIs of your core value drivers are important to your We have a question coming at an intensive rate, so I'll try to keep up with everything. Um, every risk should have a care high? No. No. Um, uh, every critical risk, ideally, uh, would have key risk indicators. But again, uh, key risk indicators require to understand the risk drivers, to be able to capture the metrics of the risk drivers, and to have a cost of collection that is under the value, of, uh, inferior to the value of the information collected. Uh, so I'd say start with your most critical risk, and most companies have a risk register and, and a selection between key risks and, and non-key risk, so start with the most important one, absolutely. But no, I wouldn't blanket care highs all over the organization. Uh, next question, for enterprise risk and strategic risk, how many risk triggers are a good number or risk triggers, or does it depend on the risk? Um, yeah, if 
I understand the question correctly, is how many risk drivers do you have per risk? Yes, it depends on the risk. Um, and again, what is the risk? What is an event? You have a chain of cause and consequences uh, that you can uh, that, that you could underline. Um, if you go back, if you look at your risk and you run a root cause analysis, level one, level two, etc., up to the uh, up to the very uh, the very end, you end up with people process systems. Um, so at the very root, you need indicators of good people, good process, good system. But of course, this is very indirect com compared to some of the risk of some some of the and you have in department A, B, C. So you need key risk indicators at different level of causality. Uh, but yes, the number of risk factors do depend on the risk absolutely. Do you have an exam any example of KRI for technology risk? Um, well, it depends what you call a technology risk. Uh, whether you call it uh, cyber threat or uh, data theft or outdated technology or overcapacity. So um, I, I don't know the details of these questions, but um, yes, there are. Talk to your IT department, basically. There are a lot of indicators uh, for technology risk. And, and actually, in, in any organization, you will find that in specific departments that have done risk management for living for decades, typically the, the fraud department, um, retail department uh, for, for, for some aspects, but definitely fraud legal and IT, they have lots of key risk indicators. They don't call it as such. In a lot of the cases, that's not how they're going to call it. But as there for the incident log, the monitoring tool, the hacking attempt, the, um, the downtime, the, the, the maintenance, the uh, license uh, um, expiration schedule, uh, they have lots of things. Um, what I do advise you to do if you are in the second line and the board asks you to define care highs, as is the case for many organizations, just to, to go to the department in question and ask them to see the list of the monitoring tools that they have. Chances are you'll find all the care highs or many or many of the care highs you need there. Uh, are the care highs the same as risk triggers? Not really. They're more metric of risk trigger. So if the risk trigger is, uh, what am I going to say? Um, if the risk trigger is, I mean, I'll go back to the HR example, but it's fatigue, for instance, or demotivation at work. Uh, how do you measure fatigue? You cannot measure fatigue in your employee, or you cannot measure uh, lower skills or insufficient knowledge. So these are the, the risk triggers, uh, but they're not your care high. So you have to find a quantifiable way uh, to proxy, to approximate these measures. So fatigue would be number of transactions or, or, or expression of the motivation like Monday morning sickness, um, uh, that sort of thing. Other... I think we have covered all uh, all the questions. So thank you very much for for all your time. It's 11:58, so I think we're at the end. Of Adam, I think this is your your time to close. Thank you very much for your attention, guys. We've gained viewing all along the webinar. I'm very happy. Um, yes, again, if I can just um, reflect what Ariane just said. Thank you to everyone who um, attended this webinar. Um, as you can see, we do actually deliver this um, at our premises in London uh, with the lovely Ariane who delivers it. Um, so please let us know if you'd like to attend. Uh, we'll be able to capture that data later on. Um, and we can also deliver this um, in-house as well, um, uh, deliver this as an in-house course at your premises. Um, as you all may know, uh, the IRM is a global risk management institute covering, amongst others, training events and certification. So, the following questions I'd like to ask um, will take a few moments of your time, and as always, your feedback is, is greatly appreciated. But just to let you all know as well that the, the slides, our training schedule, um, and any other supplementary information that we've added is actually all available for download here, um, which is uh, available on attachments. So if you click on that, 
you'll be able to download this and, and look at the presentation um, in your own time um, and at your personal reference. So please stay tuned for future webinars. Uh, there'll be a few more coming up. And of course, if there are any other questions that are coming through that we haven't answered, um, we will be able to answer them at a later stage at the, at the end of the webinar. So I'll just like to ask some more questions. Um, again, it'll take a few moments of time. I'll take about 20 seconds to ask each question, and then at the end, um, I'll close off the webinar. So thank you very much. Here is the first question. So following this webinar, which one of our KRA courses would you like more information on? The next one is on the 4th of November. The second is on the 5th, and the third is on the 2nd of July. next question I'd like to ask you guys is which of these courses would you like some more information on? Um, I've listed our top five, so um, embedding risk management, fundamentals of risk management, practical risk appetite, strategic and operational decisions, and applying ISO. The applying ISO is actually free to our members. Third question I'd like to ask you about. Just bear with me. We also run a certification. So, would you or any of you be interested in receiving information on the following qualifications International Certificate in Risk Management, International Diploma in Risk Management, or Certificate in Risk Management in Financial Services? One last uh, question we'd like to ask you before we hold off is, um, is this one. Would you be happy to be contacted by the IRM events team about forthcoming events at the IRM? Thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to um, receiving you um, on our next webinar. Again, if you have any questions, we will send the um, answers to you under separate cover. Thank you very much, and goodbye from all of us.